Okay, this is the voiceover for urinary tract problems. The first of our problems is the renal stones, um, urinary calculi, also known as urinary stones, urolithiasis. Lithiasis means stone formation, so if you ever have a lithiasis, um, you want to look at what's in front of it to find out where the stones are. So uro is urinary, urolithiasis. Um, you'll hear of cholelithiasis, um, that would be bile stones, which we'll go over next week. Um, I highly recommend the seven minute video that is there. It's very easy to understand, good info um, about how kidney stones are formed. Um, basically, they are formed more often in super saturated environments, um, which means the thick liquids full of. So, if we have a bladder and you have, um, you're excreting a ton of, let's draw our little bladder here. If you're excreting a ton of calcium, and um, for some reason, maybe you have too much calcium in there, you're excreting a bunch of calcium, and it's stored in your bladder or in your kidney um, for a brief amount of time. If there's no fluid in there, those calciums will stick together and create a stone. Um, if you are keeping that bladder or kidney area full of water, those calciums just don't have really a chance to stick together um, along with, you know, whatever they're making the stones. There's a bunch of different things that uh, create stones, uric acid, calciums, oxalates, um, struvites. Um, there's plenty of things that make stones, but the way you can prevent stones really deep bottom line is to um, increase your amounts of fluids and increase your um, hydration and increase your um, citrate level. It's the one thing you can do to prevent them. Otherwise, um, you know, you can change your diet and things like that. But basically having all of these um, crystals in your urine and then dehydrating on top of that causes these stones to form together. Um, these stones, if they are tiny, less than four millimeters, then they um, they pass through and you may have stones and you've never known it. The uh, When you do notice it is when these stones get stuck. Um, you can see here the stone is uh, kind of stuck in the ureter there. They can get stuck um, at the junction there into the bladder. They can get stuck further down in the urethra. Anywhere they get stuck, it's going to hurt. Um, that is the I think these are a couple more pictures of them getting stuck. Um, a lot of renal stones um, do get formed in the kidney and just generally pass out. It's just when they get really big that they get stuck. So when they are stuck, the pain that is caused is, um, let's go back to this other picture here. When they get stuck in the tract here, this area, let me go back, sorry. Um, and draw here. This area here starts um, spasming, trying to push that stone down the track. So these areas here, this is smooth muscle, and it will try to pass this stone along. So the only thing I can think to um, that you may have experienced is if you swallow a chip and it works its way down your esophagus and it kind of feels like it's ripping all the way down your esophagus as it works its way. It's very similar to what's going on in your ureter, but instead of a chip in your esophagus, you have a stone in your ureter. Um, this ureter is surrounded, it, this is smooth muscle, and it will propel that stone down, but it creates a lot of pain along the way as it scrapes up. These stones are not smooth uh, river pebbles. They are rough and um, rocky, and they can rip things up on their way down. So the pain is colicky, meaning it comes and it goes. It's spasmy pain. It is found in the flank, which when we talk about the flank, we're talking about the sides and the back, lower back, um, kind of if your lower back is hurting and you put your hands right there to relieve pressure on your lower back, that's exactly where the flank pain is. Um, could have pain with urination, and that's all normal. That is just um, the spasms trying to get 
the stone out. You can have urgency and frequency. Again, if you go back to this picture here and um, we're having spasms around here, um, you will have urine leaking around that. The urinary... Um, Urinary incontinence is usually when this is stuck in the urethra um, because if it's stuck here, um, it will leak into the bladder and we won't notice it. But um, if the bladder is spasming or the urethra is spasming, you can leak around there and have um, urinary incontinence. Changes in urine, pink, red, and brown urine is due to bleeding in the urinary tract. Remember, we're not supposed to have blood in our urine, but now we are scraping up that urinary tract, so there is bleeding in the um, urinary tract. Cloudy, foul-smelling urine comes from white blood cells and casts in your urine, and that is because you have an infection process going on there. Remember, whenever we're scraping up the sides of the ureter or the bladder or the urethra, um, white blood cells are going in there to clean up the things, and whenever you scrape up an area, uh, bacteria can get in there and create an infection. But you can have cloudy, foul-smelling urine that is not infected. It's just full of of white blood cells and debris. Um, having a kidney stone itself is not an emergency or not a worsening condition. Um, it is pretty common and the for you just pass the stone um, if it is stuck we can have problems. So let's go back and look at why we would have problems and what our worsening cues are. Let's look at this um, area down here. Go back. Uh, let's look at this area down here. Let's talk about this stone, this ureteral stone here. Um, let's say that this is a complete occlusion here. It's spasming. It's hurting. It's trying to push it out of the way, but it can't push it out of the way. This kidney is still making urine, right? Still making urine. This can only hold about 5 milliliters. So what is happening now behind this stone is we're getting back up. We're getting a lot of backup in here, and um, nothing can get out. But urine is still being made. The, and the pressure on this system ends up causing damage. So in the case of this big guy here um, that is lodged, no urine can get back. So as soon as this fills up with urine, then um, now we are starting to back up into these nephrons, and we're causing damage. Uh, damage to the nephrons can cause damage to the actual kidney, and if urine is not evacuated out of this area, we could end up fully damaging this kidney in the matter of a day or two um, to the point that it does not function any longer. Obstructions are very, very dangerous to the kidney. So one of our worsening symptoms or worsening cues is kidney damage. Any kind of obstruction to the kidney, and we will do this in renal failure, causes obstructive renal damage or post-renal damage. Um, the other thing that we can have besides kidney damage is kidney infection. Um, let's talk about, again, going back to our picture, um, this kidney is... Let's talk about this one right here. We'll go down to our urethral stone again. Hang on. I go to draw and then it forwards it instead. Um, let's talk about our urethral stone here. So this is scraping up and it is causing um, bleeding in this area. So now this is damaged ureter. Um, if we happen to have any bacteria in our tract, that can get in there and create a urinary tract infection. Um, any bacteria that get into this area can easily climb up our tract into our kidney here. We are not free-flowing urine, and stagnant urine, just like stagnant pond water, creates bacteria. Much more risk this all-backup urine is carrying bacteria into the kidney. So another worsening condition would be an upper urinary tract infection or a kidney infection. Fluid retention, if our kidney can't drain any fluid and there's kidney damage, we will end up having fluid retention. So we want to fix a stone before we have any of the worsening cues. Worsening cues, though, will kind of get everybody's attention a little bit more than just having a stone. You now have a stone with possible um, 
complications being kidney damage or kidney infection. So what we're going to do to monitor our urinary tract is the number one is urine output. We definitely want to keep an eye on our urine output because this is our first sign that something is going wrong. This patient needs to pee. Um, if they are not peeing, you will bladder scan them because if their bladder does not have urine, it is obstructed coming out of the kidney and that will need to be addressed right away. So urine output is our number one assessment on um, a renal stone and the moment that it starts to drop off, um, we will scan the bladder. And if it is not coming out, we're going to have to intervene. We're in a worsening condition. Um, pain level location, of course, um, hopefully the pain moves down the urinary tract as the kidney stone moves. Um, it will be pain. There's nothing really we can do to remove the pain other than pain medications. But we don't. We want to get that stone out. Um, the most important thing is letting that stone move down that track, and not obstructing urine flow. Um, hopefully, as the uh, kidney stone passes, we will watch the urine for um, for it clearing up and becoming clearer with no signs of blood or infection. Uh, we're watching the temperature to look for any kind of kidney uh, infection and we're watching for any fluid retention. Of course, we're gonna be watching our urinalysis. Um, we're gonna be checking for stones. Um, the urinalysis is going to show red blood cells, it's gonna show white blood cells, it's gonna show cast that is normal with a kidney stone because of what's happening to the urinary tract. It's getting scraped up. BUN and creatinine, we do not expect it to go up. If we see the BUN and creatinine going up and our urine output going down, that is a sign of kidney infection, I mean kidney um, failure. So you would want to notify of any worsening conditions on those. Um, a kidney stone without any problems, there's two, there's like kind of a flow chart here on what we would do with renal stones. If you have renal stones and you're urinating, then we will wait for them to pass. Um, the biggest thing for any kidney stone is increased fluid intake. They need to take three to four liters a day, dilute the urine, get pale yellow to clear urine. Um, they will be having pain due to the spasms in there, just like if you swallow a chip. You can't do anything about the pain in the esophagus. You just have to wait for it to pass. Um, they can do anti-inflammatories to reduce the pain um, down there, Tylenol, opioids. There's the full range of pain medications. The other thing they can do is actually smooth muscle relaxants or to reduce the spasm down there, so alpha blockers and antispasmodics, which I do have a card for. Um, ultrasound, um, scan the area to see where the stone is and the size of the stones. That'll give them an estimate of how long it'll take them to pass and whether they will pass or not. Um, if they are going to pass, then they are supposed to strain their urine at home and retrieve the stones. And the reason they're going to retrieve the stones is they need to test them and find out what kind of stone they are so that they can prevent them in the future. If for any reason you start decreasing urine output, then it's time for intervention. Um, intervention is... Right, decreased urine output means that our um, kidney is either not producing urine or it's still producing a ton of urine, but it is not getting down into the bladder. Um, which means we have an obstruction. Both ways we either have damage to the kidney or are going to have damage to the kidney. So we need to get interventions in sooner rather than later. Um, if you have decreased urine output, this patient will get a Foley um, straight cath to see if they can get past any of the obstruction. Of course, this will only work if the stone is in the urethra. If the stone is higher up in the ureter above the bladder, um, Foley straight catheterization will not really do anything to bypass that obstruction. Um, but they will still get a Foley for strict I's and O's to um, monitor what is in the bladder. Antibiotics, once you have an obstruction that is causing decreased urine output, you're at high, high risk for a kidney infection um, due to retained urine. So I will automatically get antibiotics to try to prevent kidney infection. And then they will usually go in and do some kind of inter invasive intervention to remove the obstructing stone. Um, 
the three that they can do. I used to have a slide for each of them, but you could certainly look them up. Um, there is the shockwave lithotripsy, which is where you um, get shock. You get basically ultrasound waves kind of pounded at the kidney, and that will basically vibrate the kidney to the point where the um, the stone breaks up into smaller pieces that can pass. They can also go up through the urethra. I'm going to go back to my my picture thing again. I should probably have this on each slide. Um, if we have, let's go back to our your little girdle stone there. Um, let's say we put in the foley on this patient. So we're going to we're going to catheterize this patient here. Here he's got his uh, fully into the bladder here. And you can see that if he's got a stone right here and right here, this guy, um, no foley in the world is going to bypass that stone. So you put in the foley and they still don't have urine output. They probably have been scanned at this point and know that the stone is up in the, ur the ureter. Um, they can take a cystoscope, which is actually they'll remove the foley and put a scope up there. And they can go in and actually nab and pull out the stones. The scope can go all the way up in there, and it can nab and pull out stones. Um, you can imagine that putting a camera all the way up through your bladder into your urethra, into your ureter, and into your kidney could cause quite a bit of damage. And then, of course, grabbing it and pulling it out can cause quite a bit of damage, but it will prevent further kidney damage. But there will be a lot of blood and white blood cells and casts as that thing clears up. Um, so I do like to kind of go back and look at that picture there. Um, so the ureteroscope stent, the ureteroscope will, um, go in there. And like I say, you can go and find the stones, break up the stones, um, pull the stones out. If you do have a stone that's maybe up in that renal pelvis, that's too big to pull down through the ureter, they can go in and surgically remove that. And that's the nephrolithotomy. Um, they could put stents in to kind of enlarge and um, and open that ureter a little bit more so that kidney stones pass, and that's the stent. Um, I'll tell you the story of my mother who had um, calcium stones because she decided that she was going to eat the chocolate calcium chews like candy. So she was eating probably three, 4,000 grams of um, calcium a day, milligrams of calcium a day. And then um, also she's got bad knees and is kind of overweight and doesn't like to get up and go to the bathroom because it hurts her knees. So she stops drinking water. So because, you know, if you drink water, you got to pee. And so if you don't drink water, you don't got to pee. So here she is getting super dehydrated, overdosing on her calcium and had giant calcium stones that um, when they went in there and scoped them, they couldn't get them. So um, what they did was they dilated her ureter with a stent. And this is almost like going in and opening up a coronary vessel. Um, they went in and opened up that ureter with a stent and kind of held it wide open so that they could pull as many of the stones out as they could. They broke up some of the stones in there with the ureter scope and then let the rest of them pass. So she had the urine stent for, I think she had that for like seven days or so. Um, and then she got a big lecture from her daughter. But... Um, Hopefully, they don't have to go in and do anything invasive. You can imagine that if you're going in and doing invasive things and putting cameras and scopes and ureters, you're going to cause quite a bit of damage to the urinary tract and much more risk of infection and permanent damage. So they're trying to get these stones to pass without intervention if they can. Um, in the case of our little man that had the ureter stone that's kind of stuck in the ureter and is causing quite a bit of pain and it's just not working its way down, there are two medications that we can do to try and help pass that process. Um, antispasmodics, anticholinergics. Um, if you remember back to when you, I hope somewhere along the line, you studied anticholinergics um, and studied the cholinergic system and the sympathetic system. Um, the cholinergic system is our rest-digest system. And some people would say, why would you want to block the rest-digest system when you want to pee? Well, when you're resting and digesting, your smooth muscle, your esophagus, your intestines, your bowels, your, um, your urinary tract is contracting during digest. So we actually give you an anticholinergic to stop 
that digestion, rest, digest in order to block it so that those muscles stop their contraction and, and busyness. Um, yes, anticholinergics will cause um, constipation, um, stomach pain, you know, gas, bloating, because you're slowing down the digest process. You're blocking that smooth muscle movement. But what we're doing is we're also trying to block the urinary smooth muscle from causing that spasms. Um, alpha blockers will block the, uh, will relax the urethral sphincter and allow things to flow from the urethra a little bit better. Um, and, you know, cause a little bit less spasming in the area as well. So both of those medications um, are given for uh, relaxation of smooth muscle. So um, just kind of keep those in the back of your mind. You'll see alpha blockers and antispasmodics coming up for multiple things because they work on all smooth muscle. Um, how we pro The big thing about calculi or um, renal stones not only is to one, bypass obstruction to avoid renal failure, renal infection, which is the big, big key in treatment, is to get those stones out of there as quickly as possible. Um, to prevent reoccurrence, you're going to prevent dehydration. Um, we're going to encourage our patients during and after treatment and for the rest of their lives to produce to drink enough fluid to produce clear or nearly clear urine. If your urine is clear or nearly clear, um, like three or four liters a day, uh, it's a lot of urine. It's way more than your um, adequate amount of urine, I mean of, of hydration, more than adequate hydration. We want this urine to be clear because then you cannot get crystals to stick together in clear diluted urine. Um, they could also make some dietary changes based on the content of the stone. Um, all stones, though, no matter what kind of stone you have, low-sodium diet because, again, high sodium causes more concentrated urine and a chance of increasing stones. They all want to increase citric acid. Citric acid is an inhibitor and will prevent stones from sticking together, so... Um, Lemons and limes have the most citric acid, so um, anything with limes, lemons, um, anything with those citrus juice, you can take citrate, you can take um, additives, um, but anyway, juices have the best, and so drinking lemon or lime juice or adding lemon and lime juice to the salad dressings, um, taking citric acid supplements will prevent those crystals from forming. It's an inhibitor. Water and citrate are your inhibitors of your stones, so you want to make sure that um, they are getting fluid intake and citrate. Um, avoiding oxalate. Oxalate pairs with calcium very easily. Calcium oxalate is the most common stone out there. Um, so avoiding oxalates. Oxalates um, attract crystals and create um, clumping very easily. Um, if you're going to eat an oxalate-rich food, so you want to avoid them, um, it's peanuts, most dairies, spinach, beets. Well, you know, someone's like, well, I love spinach salads. I love sweet potatoes. If you're going to eat them, which is fine, you want to limit them or avoid them. But if you are going to eat them, eat them with something with calcium, which seems counterintuitive if you've had calcium oxalate stones. But if you eat your oxalates with calcium-rich foods, they will pair together in the GI tract and not so much in the kidneys. So um, if you're taking calcium supplements and then eating oxalates later on in the day, um, they won't bind together, you know, so you take your calcium supplement in the morning and then, you know, at dinner time you have a spinach beet salad. Um, they're not going to pair together. The calcium's in the system and the oxalates get into the system and then they pair together in the urinary tract. So it's kind of counterintuitive. Um, we'd like you to avoid oxalates in general if you had a stone of any kind. But um, if you are going to eat something, like there's nothing wrong with a spinach beet salad. There's nothing wrong with chocolate. There's nothing wrong with eating sweet potatoes. But you might want to drink a glass of milk or something with those. Or um, maybe put some cheese with your spinach beet salad. Because then the calcium and oxalate will bind in the GI tract rather than get, rather than get digested and absorbed and put into the kidneys. Um, if you have uric acid stones, you want to limit your protein. Um, 
And of course, if you have calcium stones, limit your calcium supplements. Uric acid is a breakdown product of protein metabolism. Um, so just some ideas. You want to definitely um, take care of the kidney stone. You take care of the kidney stone, again, by, um, let's go through our summary here. Oh, go through our summary. Um, hydration, 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 and let them pass. If um, they are not going to pass or they're causing a decreased urine output, then they will get a Foley for either bypassing obstructions or, straight, or strict I's and O's. They will get antibiotics, and then they will probably need some higher intervention to get those out. So they will still get increased fluid intake, but um, you're going to move on to more invasive measures to get that stone out. And then you're going to prevent um, them from recurring by telling the patient you need to inhibit stones by staying hydrated and changing your diet. Stay hydrated, increase your citrates, and limit the um, intake of food that was causing your stones. Hopefully there's no questions on that one. Let's go on to UTIs. Um, UTIs, I'm going to call UTIs any urinary tract infection. So what they do is they generally categorize these as lower UTIs or upper UTIs. Upper urinary tract infections include the kidney. Lower urinary tract infections are um, the bladder and below. So more, of course, most common is when we think of a UTI, we think of a bladder infection or a urethritis. Um, but a kidney infection is actually technically a urinary tract infection as well. Um, the cues of them are burning, urgency, frequency. Anyone that's had a UTI will tell you it hurts to pee. You feel like you need to be on the toilet all along. Um, it hurts to not be peeing, and that is the, you're spasming in there. The, the bacteria are irritating the bladder, causing, causing bladder spasm, causing urethra spasms. Um, if you have decreased sensation down in that area, um, and not every single UTI is exactly the same, you may just have lower abdominal discomfort. If you're not having spasms, um, if the bacteria aren't causing acute pain, um, they can just cause lower abdomen discomfort. So there's a range of cues, and it doesn't one doesn't mean you don't have a UTI. You can have just vague discomfort and have a UTI. Um, one of the biggest signs is changes in your urine, so the urine being cloudy or foul-smelling, that is the sign that there is some kind of white blood cell cast going on in your urine, and that is not normal, so you'd probably want to investigate the cause of that. Um, a UTI itself needs to be treated. It's a bacteria in your urinary tract. If you do not treat it, they climb the track. Once bacteria get in there, um, I'm going to go back and do a little drawing there. Um, once you got bacterial colonies growing on here, um, they can climb. They are tricky little things. They can climb their way all up. An untreated infection will will continue up the track and can get into the kidney. So all urinary tract infections need to be treated, need to be identified and treated because untreated, they won't just go away on their own and you're much more at risk of having a um, kidney infection. So worsening of a UTI, we're going to call that climbing up the track. Um, once the bacteria climb up into the upper urinary tract, then you have the worsening cues of a kidney infection. Um, kidney infections, not only they do have dysuria, they have pain, urgency, and frequency as well, plus the hallmark of a kidney infection is a high fever. Bacteria always create a high fever. High fever, chills, um, flank pain, uh, nausea, vomiting, fatigue. You're getting an infection that is now up high in your kidney. So let's say we do have a kidney infection here. Let's draw our little uh, patient. No, go back. I don't want to answer that. Sorry. There we go. There we go. Back to my little slide here. And um, we've got our bacteria now. Oh, they already drew bacteria for us up in here. Um, we've got bacteria growing in here, 
and um, causing issues. These bacteria, think about, remember all the millions of tubules we have? What's surrounding all of these tubules? And so if these bacteria start climbing into these tubules, and the bacteria are just having a field day of a feast here. This has all kinds of electrolytes, and they're breaking down those waste products and um, using them for energy. Um, what are they going to encounter right across a small, thin membrane is they're right next to millions of tiny capillaries and bloodstreams. This is a very um, blood-filled organ, the kidney is. So when bacteria get up into the kidney, the, you are very, very high risk. One of kidney failure, the, bam, the bacteria damaging those nephrons and actually causing acute damage to the kidney but you can also get a, very, a bloodstream infection very easily. Um, in fact, most causes of bloodstream infections are from kidneys and lungs because those are the areas where we are very thin membranes and things are supposed to be exchanging across. Um, in the lungs, we exchange uh, carbon dioxide and oxygen across membranes, and in the kidney we're exchanging wastes across the membranes, but they're pretty porous, and these tiny, tiny leaky capillaries um, also get bacteria across the membranes very easily. So sepsis, number one causes of sepsis are kidney infections and lung infections, just a little fun fact there. Um, but anyway, so worsening cues of a urinary tract infection are this urinary tract infection getting up into our kidneys or our bloodstream. So again, this is just kind of the stages that if you do not treat it, um, it will colonize, it gets up into the bladder, gets up into the kidneys and could cause damage to the kidneys and could even um, get into your bloodstream as well. So of course, again, we are worried our worsening cues are kidney infection um, so we are going to be watching our urine output because that will be the first sign that something is going wrong with our kidneys is our urine output will drop. Pain level location, hopefully it gets improving, but if your patient was having just urinary frequency and now all of a sudden having back pain, um, that is a sign that it has ascended into the, um, into the kidneys. Uh, urine color consistency, hopefully it clears up if it does not and starts to get pink. Um, bloody, that means we are wasting more red blood cells. There could be actually an active um, opening now in the urinary tract. So just keep an eye on the urine color consistency. It should be clearing up if you're treating it. If it's not, it will get worse. Temperature, you want to make sure that it gets better. But again, we are looking for um, that kidney infection. We don't want that to happen. So if our temperature was normal and now it's starting to climb, we need to worry about the infection climbing and ascending the track. You can also worry a temperature could be a sign of sepsis. So um, we'll keep an eye on that temperature as well as we treat the patient to make sure we're not worsening. Um, heart rate, blood pressure, those should be stable. The reason they're there is because a drop in heart rate and a drop in, or sorry, an increase in heart rate and a drop in blood pressure can indicate sepsis. Um, so we have those there as something to monitor too because it's one of our worst case scenarios. Um, we'll watch the urinalysis and then if there's any decrease in urine output, we'll probably keep an eye on the BUN and creatinine. Again, we're not going to keep drawing invasive labs when we have a urine output to monitor things. If our urine output is adequate, we probably don't have renal damage going on. Um, so, you know, again, NCLEX and um, I am very interested in you not just going and stabbing patients for labs when you do have an assessment that will tell you the same thing for a lot less money and a lot less invasiveness. Um, and urine output is our assessment that we'll be watching on that, just like on renal stones. Um, to treat a urinary tract infection, um, one, if you had a catheter in, take it out. You shouldn't have a catheter in. That is just a direct line for bacteria straight into the bladder. And once they're in the bladder, they can easily ascend into the, um, the urinary tract and go up into the kidney. Um, before giving any antibiotics, try to get a specimen, a culture. That is a good rule of thumb for any um, infection at all. Before you treat it with antibiotics, you should have an idea of the source and be culturing the source. That's why they, um, if you go to an urgent care with a urinary tract, the first thing they're going to do is get a urine specimen before they treat you because we want to know what bacteria cause it. They will treat it 
with the most common bacteria. They'll treat you for the most common bacteria that cause UTIs, um, but you do want to verify the the uh, the uh, bacteria that you're treating is the one that's in there causing the infection. Um, so obtain a clean catch urine or a catheter specimen prior to any kind of antibiotics. Um, increase fluids, again, flushing, flushing, flushing. It works to get rid of kidney stones. It also works to get rid of bacteria. Fluids, fluids, fluids. Um, if you have an increased BUN and creatinine and you have signs of renal failure, we may not give you that much fluids, but otherwise fluids, fluids, fluids. And the only thing that's going to fix the problem is antibiotics. Um, so the only thing that fixes it is antibiotics. The rest of it is stuff that you do before you start the antibiotics, but you have to do antibiotics for a urinary tract infection. Um, pain relief is nice. Um, you can do anti-inflammatories, and they actually have a specialized urinary analgesic, which is a lifesaver. Um, but non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, urinary analgesics. But the main one, the big deal, is antibiotics. If you don't get antibiotics, this will get into a worsening situation. Um, to teach the patient to prevent it, um, probably everyone has had some kind of um, UTI, you know, education in the past, whether it's family, friends, kids. Um, e. coli is the most common um, bacteria, and it's the one they try to treat until a, a, a uh, urinalysis comes back with something else on the culture. Um, poor hygiene, of course, if you're not cleaning the area, bacteria can grow and climb up into the area. Um, wiping fecal matter to the front over to the urethra entrance um, causes fecal bacteria to get up in the area. Um, retained urine gets infected. So anytime you have any kind of retained urine, you're at high risk of infection. So, um, Men with prostate cancer have obstructions and retained urine. Um, men, women with kidney stones have problems with obstruction, retained urine. Women or men with bladder prolapse or um, the picture over here on the side is a bladder that probably never fully empties because there's always some kind of residual urine in the background there. Um, that is constantly never being voided and just sits there um, and probably gets infected. So people with retained urine um, have a high, high risk of getting infected. Um, people with high sugar in their diets, um, bacteria are going to just eat up that sugar. So if you've got glucose in your urine, much higher risk of just your feeding bacteria, for goodness sakes. Um, and any time you're doing any kind of, um, you know, uh, sexual activity, any shoving in the area, especially women. Women are much more prone to that. Um, you can see that the two entrances here are very close together. So a lot of friction, um, any kind of um, movement there um, without any kind of lubrication or anything can cause bacteria to get shoved up into the urethra and um, can cause a UTI. So um, Voiding before and after um, sexual intercourse is always good. Um, any urinary catheter use, again, you've got a catheter going straight up there that bacteria can just march right on up into that bladder. Um, so urinary catheter use is a huge uh, risk factor. So trying to reduce risk factors um, to prevent reoccurrence. Make sure, though, that even if you have risk factors, um, that you are doing fluid intake, clear or nearly clear urine to flush, flush, flush. Anything in the urinary tract, really, we're going to try and flush it unless the kidney doesn't work. Um, flush, 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 three to four liters a day. Um, emptying the bladder as completely as you can to prevent retained urine. Um, cranberry juice, cranberry tablets may acidify the urine and... Um, you know, urinary bacteria might not like acidified urine as much, but um, those bacteria can become resistant and can can start enjoying an acidic environment as well. Um, so really fluid and flushing, fluid and flushing and good hygiene and avoiding catheters. And I think that is all on our summary slide as well. Really, the only thing that will treat the problem is antibiotics. Remember, antibiotics, no matter whether it's low or high um, infection, it's an infection, it needs antibiotics. Culture it first before you start the antibiotics so that you don't mess up your culture. And flush, flush, flush. I think... Um, 
the next one we're going to talk about is the um, glomerulonephritis. So we're kind of going higher and higher into the urinary tract here. Um, we talked about cystitis, urethritis, blad, you know, cystitis is bladder going up into the kidney. Glomerular, uh, glomerulonephritis is an infection of the glomerulus, the first stop on that filtering section, high up in the kidneys, and it's not usually an ascending infection, like just pyelonephritis is the whole kidney being infection, infected from the bottom up. Glomerulonephritis is kind of from the top of the kidney down, and it has a different cause. E. coli is the cause of most lower urinary tract infections and pyelonephritis. Glomerulonephritis, um, the main cause is staph, and we have that on the next page. But this is inflammation and irritation of the glomerulus. And if you remember from our regular, um, our normal, we have that nice little loop of Henley there. We have our little blood going around there. And then we have our little filtrate bus. You guys watched that, right? So you've got your filtrate bus. You've got the loop of Henley. The glomerulus is the guy at the very beginning of this. And this is where everything, and if you don't remember this one, um, that's fine. Go back and watch the normal lecture. It was only half an hour. Um, this is where everything gets pushed off the bus into the urine, but then gets reabsorbed, where the protein gets reabsorbed. So the problem with glomerulonephritis, when the um, glomerulus is irritated and um, leaky, is that um, you drop protein. You end up losing protein. Um, it's an inflammation, so it's a lower-grade fever. Remember, we are worried with pyelonephritis. That's usually bacterial, high fever. Um, coming up from the urinary tract. Glomerulonephritis is at the beginning of these nephrons and is usually an inflammation, irritation, low-grade fever. Um, they will have bubbly or foamy colored urine, which is what happens when you leak protein. So high protein colored urine is cola colored no matter how much there is. You can drink eight liters a day, and if you're leaking protein, your urine will be dark and um, foamy because of the proteins in there. Um, much higher, they're, they're leaky capillaries, they end up, um, and when you break the glomeruli or they're inflamed or it's irritated, do we remember what is released from glomeruli? What one symptom? It's got a couple hormones that they're able to release. Broken or damaged glomeruli release renin, and renin causes fluid um, retention. So broken glomeruli release renin, increases your blood pressure, and causes fluid retention. So this renin thing is coming back here to bite us in the butt here. It causes increased blood pressure and increased fluid and increased sodium. So guess what? Just knowing what the renin means, you got your, you got your um, signs and symptoms right there. High blood pressure, um, and swelling. Um, the urinalysis, what's being dumped into that urine? Proteins, 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 red blood cells, white blood cells, things that shouldn't have gotten out of the blood and into the filtrate are now in the blood and um, in the filtrate. So um, increased sodium in the urinalysis. I'm just reading my slide there, and that is not true. Your urinalysis does not have increased sodium in it. It will actually have decreased sodium in it. Your sodium is being retained. That's part of aldosterone's job. And since aldosterone is being stimulated, you get fluid and sodium retention into the bloodstream, which means you have less sodium leaking out of there. Um, in fact, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this sodium thing out of there at all because you could have leaky you could have some sodium leaking out of there. The, the worrisome thing isn't so much the sodium in the urine. The worrisome thing is proteins in the urine. This is the one that I want you to remember. Um, there are proteins in the urine, and proteins shouldn't be there. Um, so when you have a low-grade fever, foamy, cola-colored urine, and peripheral edema, high blood pressure, we've got a problem with the glomerulus there. And then when you draw the urinalysis and you see the proteins, it just confirms that there is something wrong with the glomerulus. It's not supposed to be dumping proteins. We need those proteins um, to create things. Again, they're supposed to be getting recycled. They're supposed to be getting used to do essential functions in the body. Um, we shouldn't lose them. So proteins in the urinalysis are a big, big 
clue that there's something going on at the very beginning of that nephron, and that is a glomerulus there. So um, if we have something wrong in that glomerulus, you are at definite risk of your kidney being damaged. It's already um, secreting renin. It's increasing its fluid. It's increasing its blood pressure. Um, its main regulatory body there, that glomerulus, is being damaged. So you're at definite risk of renal failure with an infection that high up in your kidney. Um, so the signs and symptoms aren't all that much different. They're already having fluid retention. They're already having high blood pressure. You want to make sure that they are still putting out urine. Um, if they stop putting out urine, you're at high, high risk of um, seeing some kidney failure there. And then because this glomerulus where blood and filtrate are interchanging is now infected, you're at high risk of getting an infection in your bloodstream as well. So, of course, again, our main, main assessment is the urine output because this is how we're going to keep an eye on our kidney. We can, of course, draw BUN and creatinine, but why spend the money on labs when we have something that tells us whether our kidneys are working or not? If we are putting out adequate urine, our kidneys are working. If we are not, our kidneys are not. So um, we're going to be keeping an eye on the urine output and the quality, the urine color consistency. We don't want, um, we can watch a urinalysis. We can send that off for proteins. They should be reducing the protein, should be coming clearer, less foamy as treatment goes on. What's the treatment for it? What's the treatment for it? Um, antibiotics. We just have to treat the infection, and I don't think somewhere on there, yeah, there it is, it's at the end, that's not fair. Um, the most common is due to streptococcus. Um, glomerulonephritis, the most common, um, this is the most common cause of it is a untreated strep infection. So um, that's why the antibiotics are usually penicillins or cephaloforins because we're treating a different kind of infection. Glomerulonephritis comes from strep. Glomerulonephritis usually comes from strep. So we're going to treat, so if you come in UTI and give them um, something to treat E. coli, that may not fix glomerulonephritis. So knowing the signs and symptoms and knowing what you're treating is um, very important there. But for the patient, um, you're still going to try to flush, 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 um, and you wanna make sure that they get their antibiotics do your urine culture prior to giving the antibiotics, just like any kind of urinary tract infection. But our suspected um, bacteria is different with glomerulonephritis versus a regular urinary tract infection. Um, we do add a low sodium diet on this one. There weren't diet restrictions with pyelonephritis um, or UTIs because unless there's renal damage, there's no other issues um, with your diet. But a low-sodium diet on this one, because we're already holding on to fluid and sodium, we don't need to be eating sodium as well. Um, because their renin is causing their blood pressure to go up, they may need blood pressure reduction as well. So again, the most common cause of glomerulonephritis is a post or a strep infection that wasn't treated um, or was treated late or just wasn't treated well. Maybe someone didn't finish their course of antibiotics. Post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis develops uh, a week to three weeks after the strep infection. Um, if it's not due to strep, it's just known as nephritic syndrome, meaning that if there's an irritation to the glomerulus and they don't really know why, um, and they'll have to look into more causes or treat the cause that it, they'll find out the cause through the urinalysis. But usually when a patient comes in um, with Brown, uh, sorry, brown cola-colored frothy urine, um, peripheral facial edema, and um, proteins in the urine, they're going to treat it as a post-streptococcal infection unless it's proven otherwise by the urinalysis. Um, so E. coli, most common for lower UTIs and pyelonephritis. Strep is most common for glomerulonephritis. Um, Treatment for both kinds, either lower or glomerulonephritis, is antibiotics. Just like we said, there are different antibiotics for a lower TUTI or pyelonephritis because that's usually treating E. coli. Um, I'll just write that there next to it. These are for E. coli. 
and glomerulonephritis is for, well, I could probably write it a little bit neater than that, huh? This is most commonly E. coli, and this is most commonly strep. So a little bit different antibiotics because of a little bit of the cause of different of causative bacteria. Um, with all antibiotics, full course of antibiotics, not just till the disappearance of symptoms. Um, if you have a lower UTI that is causing um, urinary frequency pain, um, pain with peeing, um, there is a urinary analgesic called um, pyridium. I could say phenylpyridine, I guess. I say everything wrong. Um, pyridium, it's available over the counter. The most important thing to tell people, including my daughters, um, is that pyridium is an analgesic and does not treat the infection. You have to use it in combination with antibiotics. Oops, I didn't mean to cross that out. I want to highlight that in combination with antibiotics. If you're going to, so does not heal infection, does not heal infection. People will take the peridium now that it's over the counter and think that their UTI is going away because it doesn't hurt anymore. But again, we've seen that bacteria colonizing in there, pain is just one of the symptoms. They can climb right up that track and get into the kidneys. Um, people that treat their UTIs with the pain relief but not antibiotics usually do end up with a kidney infection later on because untreated infections get worse. Um, so please be sure to mention to patients that even though this does exist, antibiotics are the only thing that fixes the actual infection. Let's see, so that's our summary. Um, for nephritic syndrome, and I thought we had one for UTI as well. Oh, you might have to make your own table for UTI. Did I put one at the end of UTI? I think I did. Yes, I did. Okay, so you do have one for UTI, pyelonephritis, and you got one for glomerulonephritis. And now we're going to talk about a few genetic disorders um, or autoimmune disorders. This one's called nephrotic syndrome, which you will see again in peds, so don't go too far uh, with throwing away these sheets. Um, nephrotic syndrome is a damage to the glomerulus that causes high amounts of protein in the urine, but there's no infection. This is what they think is a, um, a genetic autoimmune disorder where the glomerulus is attacked by our autoimmune system, causing it to be leaky and causing it to lose proteins. So, um, this almost looks exactly like glomerulonephritis, except there is no fever, um, and high, high amounts of proteinuria. Um, this just gets leaked out, so cola color urine. Um, high blood pressure, same causes as glomerulonephritis. It's just not a bacteria causing it. It's an autoimmune response. So we still have our glomerulus. It's not inflamed. So we're going to draw our little combo here. Let's draw our filtrate. So we still have our same track, but now we have damage here at the membrane level, and so protein are leaking into the urine. But because we have damage at this level, what is being released to damaged glomeruli is renin. And when renin is released, we get an increased blood pressure, and we get increased fluids and sodium. It's just doing its job, but unfortunately, it's releasing renin inappropriately. And then the other problem that we're having that makes things worse is that we're now peeing out our major body protein, which is albumin. We need that albumin. The albumin is gone, and when albumin is gone, look what happens to our blood vessels. Let me clear this and draw a blood vessel. So normally we have these big globs of albumin in our blood vessels. And what do you think that albumin is doing in there? It's a big, thick thing. Like, look at that big, thick albumin in that egg picture there. What do you think the purpose of albumin running around in the bloodstream is? It's to attract water. 
because when things are thick, water will go in there. It keeps water in the bloodstream at a certain level. So we have a certain amount of albumin that we're supposed to circulate around in our bloodstream. So let's take red, let's get rid of our albumin. We've peed it all out. So there's no albumin in our bloodstream. There's only one instead of a bunch of them. So we don't have any fluid coming in. There's nothing to attract the fluid. So the fluid's staying out here in the tissues. Nothing's attracting it into the bloodstream and you end up swelling. So without albumin in our bloodstream, we end up with a lot of peripheral edema on top of the renin causing fluid restriction. So we have a lot of fluid retention, which then leaks out because there's nothing to keep it in the blood vessel, making edema worse. So with glomerulonephrotic syndrome, um, we not only are losing some proteins, we're losing all of our major proteins with nephrotic syndrome, and that causes quite a bit of swelling. Um, high blood pressure because of the renin um, angiotensin issue, high sodium due to the secretion, um, lots of edema. Um, the body tries to make up for all its lost proteins by making more fats. To, they can turn into proteins. Um, just basically um, a big issue with fluid volume overload. It's usually children. Um, you can keep it all the way into adulthood, um, but a broken glomerulus that doesn't filter can cause um, more problems with the kidney. So pulmonary edema, just due to the, not only are you retaining fluid like glomerulonephritis, you're actually physically losing more protein than even glomerulonephritis. Um, and so all of that lost protein causes fluid to leak out of the vessels. And where do we leak fluid out of our vessels? Is into the capillaries where we do exchange, which is out in our feet, out in our fingers, out in our periphery, um, and in our lungs. So whenever we have, when we talk about peripheral edema, we usually mean extremity edema and a risk of pulmonary edema as well. So because of that, again, we are monitoring for any renal failure. So our urine output is our best indicator of whether our kidneys are working. Use the urine output. Um, blood pressure is an indicator of whether we're stopping that renin retention or not. Keep an eye on that blood pressure. Um, keep an eye on your edema. So I'd say urine output and edema are our two big ones on this one because this will tell us how well we're doing with our treatment to see if things are getting better. Um, my son's best friend has nephrotic syndrome and is on a... Um, low sodium diet, which you can imagine, a low sodium diet. We'll talk a little bit about the treatment of it, but um, will sometimes stress will cause a flare up of the nephrotic syndrome and will have all of a sudden a spike in blood pressure and an increase in edema uh, needs to go in for more treatments. Um, but it is genetic autoimmune, not much you can do about it. So what we do whenever anything's an autoimmune process is try to block the immune system. And we block the immune system with steroids, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, or actually anti-rejection drugs. Um, those are the big gun immune suppressants. So you can imagine that when you are treating a problem and shutting down the immune system, you're at high risk for getting infections somewhere else. Um, we also do symptom control. Treating edema will not fix our nephrotic syndrome. The only thing that's going to fix the nephrotic syndrome is an increase in anti-immune um, drugs, shutting down the immune response that's killing off the glomeruli. But in the meantime, treating edema with diuretics and a low-sodium diet, and then um, they are also uh, risk for clots because you lose the, um, I do believe that was on the previous slide, um, they're losing the proteins. I think that's altered immune function because you lose the proteins that are used for a normal immune system, which, hey, we're shutting down the immune system. That's fine. But we are also losing proteins that are used to make, um, that are um, used to get rid of clots. We need proteins to do our normal body functions. Our body is constantly making little clots and things, and uh, we're dissolving them with fiber. And, and without all of that, we... Um, we can get a lot of clots. So controlling symptoms and doing anti-inflammatories with nephrotic syndrome. Um, 
avoid exacerbations. Um, and you will see with all of our autoimmune diseases, um, you're giving autoimmune drugs and you're also trying to prevent exacerbations um, with those. So here's your your summary slide for nephrotic syndrome. And remember, these summary slides are going to go away after this week, but you can see that we are just trying to put the key elements into the five columns so that you can know enough about the disease to, um, but these are your study guides really, right here is these charts. Um, the last genetic disease is polycystic kidney disease. This again is genetic, um, bad luck card. Um, this is just basically where the kidney becomes filled with fluid-filled cysts rather than useful kidney tissue. Um, it progresses slowly over decades. In fact, most people don't even know they have it until late, 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 um, and even up until they actually have kidney failure. Sometimes they don't even notice these kidneys growing and growing and growing until you get um, kidney failure, which is anuria. Again, our urine outputs our greatest cue as to something's going wrong with our kidneys. Um, again, because these kidneys are damaged and dysfunctional, they are releasing renin, causing hypertension, causing um, edema, um, heaviness. These kidneys are huge. On this side right here, this is a normal kidney. This one is normal. And these are the cystic kidneys. So you can see they are like four times the size of our normal kidney. Um, they'll have headaches from their hypertension. Um, if these cysts rupture, they'll bleed. So sometimes you'll have bloody urine. Um, they will have signs and symptoms of um, kidney infections. But no, when you get the urinalysis, of course, there's no bacteria in there. So there's no bacterial infection. Um, unfortunately, they sometimes don't know about it until um, they get sent to a urologist for frequent workup because they're going in complaining of um, frequent UTIs or they get treated for hypertension and nothing's working. Um, they will finally go in and do an ultrasound and find these big boys hanging out in their belly. Um, really the worsening cue, which 50% of them will develop end-stage renal disease, um, is renal failure. Um, so we're going to monitor these patients. Unfortunately, it is genetic. There's nothing we can do. There is no cure for it. Um, the only treatment is going to be lowering the hypertension, taking control of the edema, and then um, hopefully if it does progress to end-stage renal disease, um, they can have a kidney transplant. They didn't do anything to damage their kidneys. Um, the kidneys were genetically damaged. So just symptom treatment and then probably genetic counseling. Anytime something is genetic and uncontrollable and we have no cure for it, we will do genetic counseling um, to make sure that they understand the risks of having kids with it um, because you could be passing on this faulty gene. So um, genetic counseling really to just prevent it from being transmitted to um, future generations, but there is nothing we can really do for polycystic kidney disease. Um, I think there's your thing for polycystic kidney disease. I think I have a few things to say about neurogenic bladder. We'll talk about this again when we do a couple of other, when we talk about uh, neuromuscular systems and when we do spinal cord injuries. Um, but just because it involves the bladder, we're going to put it in here as a disorder. Neurogenic bladder is bladder dysfunction um, due to something um, innervation, whether the brain is accepting signals properly, whether the nerves are broken, whether the nerves are overactive or overstimulated. Um, neurogenic bladder could be a paralyzed bladder that does not respond to um, or doesn't feel like it's getting full, or it could be a completely um, spasmy uh, bladder. There's kind of neurogenic bladder could be either way. So it was like, which one is it? Is it a paralyzed bladder or is it a spasmy bladder? It could be either one. Um, so really what we're looking for there is there's some kind of neurogenic problem with nerve transmission that's causing you to either retain urine in the bladder and not have any feeling that you're retaining urine in the bladder. Um, so these bladders can swell to over a liter and you'll not get any of your urge to void um, if you have a paralyzed or flaccid bladder. 
Um, you can also spasm around the bladder, could spasm inappropriately um, due to bad innervation, and you could have frequency or incontinence. So you could retain or not be able to void, or you could have frequency incontinence, but basically the bladder is not functioning normally. Um, whenever we retain urine in the bladder or the bladder doesn't work um, we're at risk for bacteria growing and you're having a cystitis, which promotes to a kidney failure. Um, the intervention on this, and we, like I said, we will talk about this more often in other disease processes, is bladder training. Um, sometimes these cat patients have to be intermittently catheterized. Um, the causes there of nerve dysfunction to the bladder um, are diabetes, frequent bladder infections that damage the bladder, um, injury to the spinal cord, uh, multiple sclerosis is a big one where the, um, the nerves to the bladder are damaged, um, tumors, there's multiple reasons. Um, but really what I wanted to tell you is that the treatments for a neurogenic bladder um, sometimes we'll try bladder retraining, which is basically going voiding on a schedule, not waiting for a nerve to tell you it's time to go, but rather voiding on a schedule. Um, there can be medications to reduce spasm. Again, we've got those antispasmodics. They will actually sometimes do, if it's an overspasmy bladder, you can put botulism in it. But we really want to reduce the amount of urinary retention. So voiding fully every three to four hours, not waiting for an urge, is a key, the bladder retraining. They can get um, electrical stimulation devices, um, but... For the paralyzed or the urinary retention bladder, there's a couple of different um, interventions there. You can manually press down on the bladder, called a crede maneuver. Um, they can tap the bladder to get it to um, respond reflex-wise to voiding. Um, you can bear down to empty the bladder, and they can intermittently catheterize. But really, the goal of neurogenic bladder is to get urine out of it on a routine basis every three to four hours. Um, we don't want urine retaining in there longer than that because it can get infected and cause pyelonephritis or renal failure. Um, let's see. We've got the urine surgeries now. Nephrectomy. This is where we go in and cut out a piece of a bad kidney or a damaged kidney or actually um, doing a donation of kidney. So this is just basically any kind of kidney surgery. Um, the things I want to point out on kidney surgery is where the incision is. Look at that incision. It's kind of high up there. Those kidneys don't sit down near our butt. They're actually right up under the rib cage on our backside. So the incision is right under the diaphragm. So um, when I talk about these procedures, I am going to be telling you what we expect after a procedure and what we don't expect after a procedure. So it's a little bit different from our problems. We have recognizing that we have the problem and whether the problem's worsening. After a procedure, we know they've had a problem. We know they've had a procedure. And we know we're going to expect a few things after the procedure. So that's what I do when we... Um, when we're talking about a nephrectomy or any kind of um, kidney procedure, uh, no matter what kind of surgery it is, we expect them to have pain. They just had surgery. But where the pain is, is up in the diaphragm. I just want you to know where it is because pain anywhere else is probably not normal and not associated with the surgery. But up under the diaphragm, up under the rib cage, that is normal. That's where the surgery did happen. And because the surgery um, happens just below the diaphragm and there's pain right there at the diaphragm, they do end up with atelectasis, meaning that they don't inflate their lungs all the way there because it hurts to take a deep breath and cause that lung to rub up against the diaphragm, which rubs up against the surgery site. Um, so atelectasis or um, a little bit of a collapsed lung on that side is normal. We have to treat that. Decreased bowel sounds is normal after any kind of abdominal surgery, no matter what kind, but definitely after a um, renal surgery, they're going in there and pushing bowels out of the way. Um, normal to see drainage. It is not normal to see bleeding. It is not normal for your kidney to shut down afterwards. Um, and it is not normal for your bowels to not function after surgery or to get an infection. So, um, over bleeding, um, hopefully we will not see any bleeding under the site, but I do want to point out Turner and Cullen sign if you haven't heard about that before. 
Cullen sign. People like to remember C around the umbilicus is Cullen sign. Turner's sign is um, on the sides um, on the flank. So basically, Gray Turner sign is flank bleeding. So on this uh, picture here, this is Turner sign. This is flank bleeding pretty big cue that something's going on on the kidney side. Um, it's also um, dependent drainage, so any kind of abdominal bleeding will show up like this, but um, kidneys that bleed are going to bleed into the abdominal space, and when you're laying on your back, that blood will collect around the back and the sides. Um, so any bleeding that's coming in the urine, so if you have a kidney um, Kidney surgery, you'll probably have a Foley in for eyes and O's um, if there's any bleeding in the urine or any Turner Cullen sign or decreased blood pressure, increased heart rate, suspect bleeding. It's a very vascular organ, and when we cut a vascular organ, you can have bleeding. Keep an eye out for that. Um, it is not normal for the kidney to fail. Remember, we can go down to a quarter of one kidney before we have renal failure. So any signs of renal failure is a complication that we do not expect after a nephrectomy. Um, no bowel sounds is called a paralytic ileus. It's normal to have decreased bowel sounds. That's why you advance people's diets very slowly after surgeries and after procedures. But listening to the bowel and having no bowel sounds is an abnormal finding and we need to be notified. Of course, infection is a bad no-no sign. So key assessments kind of go with looking for our complications, um, pain level, making sure it's not getting worse, respirations because of our risk of atelectasis, bowel sounds because of the bowel movements, um, because of the bowel involvement there and the low bowel sounds, looking for abdominal distension, that's a sign that you have either bleeding or um, bowel issues going on, um, temperature for infection, They'll want their pain medicine. They need their pain medicine so they can take deep breaths, and we really need to keep atelectasis under control because if you don't treat atelectasis, you can get a pneumonia in there. Um, so just a little bit about the post-op care there. Um, anytime we have bleeding into a catheter, um, bleeding can clot. And anytime we have bleeding into a urine catheter, we want to make sure that our urine output is good and that um, the drainage is not getting clotty or the urine output's not dropping off. If it is, um, we irrigate the catheter, and I'll talk a little bit about that in devices, and we'll talk a little bit about bladder irrigation. Um, we have to keep a catheter clear. We're doing clean eyes. We're doing uh, um, eyes and O's and looking for uh, a risk of renal failure. We don't want a catheter clotting off um, due to bloody drainage, so we will keep that catheter clear. Um, and there is your summary. So you can notice that the remit um, card is a little bit different for post-procedure. Instead of um, evaluate for worsening conditions, we're listening for complications. Um, the interventions are really, yeah, they've already had their surgery. What do we expect to happen after the surgery and how do we treat expected problems? Um, and how would we uh, treat any worsening complications? We would notify of worsening complications. So I just kind of tried to put, um, you know, normal procedure care afterwards so that you know what to expect and what not to expect after the procedure. So that is the end of that lecture. Sorry it droned on a little long, but hopefully you can find the sections that you wanted um, more information on. And I will be back with renal failure.